Good evening, everyone. Daja hao. My name is uh, Ilan Alon, and I'm a Cornell Professor of International Business, Director of the China and India Centers in Rollins College, and a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. And it is my great pleasure to chair and moderate uh, today's session on Chinese outward foreign direct investment. I think that Professor Sachs has given us a wonderful introduction on the current situation, and I hope he didn't depress you all, <laughs> because I think there are some uh, interesting things that are happening with respect to Chinese investments abroad and the kind of potential that it could bring to the global recession. Uh, Professor Sachs mentioned that by 2017, China is likely to be the largest economy in the world. Depending on how you measure the size of the economy, whether it's uh, GDP or purchasing power parity GDP, uh, most estimates agree that by 2025, uh, China will certainly be the largest economy in the world. Of course, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that much because they're also the most populous nation in the world. So the most populous nation in the world should also have the largest economy, naturally. Uh, but what about the story of the uh, outward foreign direct investment? Uh, this is a story that uh, uh, started only recently, in the last decade or so, and really picked up momentum uh, after uh, 2000. And right now, the Chinese outward foreign direct investment is about uh, $60 billion. Now, that sounds like a big number. It certainly <coughs> is a big number. But if you take it into consideration that the Chinese economy is almost the size of the American economy, by the standard of the size of the economy, Chinese outward foreign direct investment is still very small and is likely to grow. Estimates range from somewhere around $500 million by 2020 to $5 trillion uh, by 2020. So to move between 2012, where we are now uh, at 60 billion, to potentially $5 trillion of our foreign direct investment means that Chinese investment will accelerate around the world. Uh, now, is that realistic? Uh, certainly it will accelerate, and there's a number of good reasons for that to happen. On the macro level, uh, China has uh, the largest uh, reserves of $3.5 trillion. It has, uh, it has to its advantage a currency that is undervalued and it could allow it to appreciate somewhat. Uh, it's also lucky because at the time that it's uh, acquiring assets around the world, the world is facing uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression, which means that China is now able to buy uh, cents on the dollars assets around the world, including resources. Chinese savings rates quite high. And I think most importantly, China is hungry. It is the newborn in the block, and it's hungry for global dominance. On the micro level, Chinese companies, and particularly the state-owned enterprises, have been directed by the government to go out there and to seek new markets, to boldly go where no one has gone before, to seek out new resources, and to seek out strategic assets, technologies, brands, know-how. And the current trend shows that that's exactly what they're doing. So we are here, uh, compiled a, a list of five experts who really are worldwide experts in the field of Chinese OFDI. They are uh, experts who have traversed both the academic world uh, and the business world and will provide, I think, singular uh, explanations of what is happening in OFDI, why is it happening, how is it happening, and what is the impact of the Chinese OFDI on the world economy. If you want to really get a good, in, to complement their talks, if you want to get a good perspective on what is happening, I suggest that you pick the East Asia Forum Quarterly, uh, which is available in the front. It was aptly edited uh, by uh, Shang Jin Wei and Peter Drysdale. And it, the entire focus of the entire issue is China's investment abroad. I believe it's probably one of the most current and comprehensive treatment of the topic and will allow you to really come up to date with some of the contemporary issues facing Chinese <coughs> OFDI. The way we're going to run this uh, panel is I'm going to ask each of the speakers to go in turn uh, for about 10 minutes. 
And what I'd like you to do, uh, for brevity and for time's sake and for efficiency's sake, is to hold off on your questions until uh, each one of the speakers <laughs> has uh, finished. And uh, at the moment, we have, uh, we have some cards that are being passed around. And should you have a question, please write it down. And at the end, we're going to collect those cards when the last speaker is going. And I will select some of these questions based on the amount of time we have left and uh, ask the panelists uh, to react to it. So we're going to start off uh, with uh, Daniel Rosen, <coughs> who is not only a Columbia University adjunct professor, but also a Rhodium Group partner somebody who has worked uh, with uh, Chinese industry, with American industry, uh, helping bridge the two uh, economies and doing some very interesting thing. Uh, Yiping Huang uh, is in Barclays Capital, but he's also in the Australian National University and at Peking University. Uh, Doug Ritchie uh, represents uh, uh, Rio Tinto. Uh, Yang Yao uh, is representing Peking University. And uh, Greg Mills, finally, will talk from uh, Brent Hurst Foundation, uh, giving us an African perspective on the rise of China. So without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's welcome Daniel Rosen. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, can we speak from the, from the yeah, table here just course. to save time going back and forth? Great. Well, um, that will be a hard act to follow. Uh, making the transition from Jeff Sachs' extraordinary uh, tour the planet um, to this very narrow new topic of China's global outbound direct investment, which means a couple different things. It means greenfield investments, building factories from the ground up, and it means merger and acquisitions, buying go uh, going concerns and businesses which are already in existence outside of China's borders. Important that we all understand it doesn't mean portfolio investment. So we're not talking about China buying treasury bills or stocks and bonds or things like that. <coughs> this is brick, more bricks and mortar stuff that we're, we're, we're here to discuss. Um, <coughs> Uh, the boom in China's uh, investment into China started, of course, 25 years ago or more. And to date, there's $1.5 trillion of foreign direct investment in China. But developing poor countries don't know how to do it around the world yet. And it's only since about 2005, and first as a, as a resource, uh, natural resource imperative, that Chinese firms started uh, picking up the challenge <coughs> and actually going out and trying to do deals. Only since 2009, 2010 have we seen significant flows of Chinese investment into the developed world, into the United States and into the European Union that we have today. Partly because it's so new, partly because China is unique, and partly because China is very non-transparent in some ways, the, the advent of this new direct investment in our backyards, <coughs> in, the, in the EU and the United States, uh, raises at once uh, hopes that somehow China might be riding in to save uh, Europe from uh, bankruptcy, let's say, or insolvency, and fears uh, that the firms showing up are here for a fire sale, where they're going to be plucking out assets or otherwise um, benefiting uh, a as a result of our distress, of our economic distress. Uh, those fears and those hopes are natural, but of course they're not particularly empirical and they don't really necessarily match up with the pattern of what's happening. So that's what I think we're, we're hoping most to start a conversation with you here tonight. When we, as Ilan suggested, there's a variety of different, say, 2020 projections of how big a number this could be. It's only 60 billion or so a year to date. A total Chinese portfolio around the world of maybe 300 and Fifty billion dollars to 2020, it could easily be one to two trillion. It could be three trillion. Um, how do we? And that's of course a projection of what would happen if business as usual continues. Um, as Jeff Sachs noted, you know, business as usual could definitely you know fail us in the a matter of weeks, let alone years. But the way we get to such big numbers is that is by asking, well. Given its GDP size, its weight in the world today, China actually has much less investment abroad than other countries did at similar levels of per capita income. So if China even grows 6 7%, what have you, to 2020, what would the normal curve look like in terms of their outbound investment growth? And that's where we get to something like 1 to 2 trillion. That's a very conservative number, um, big enough to be pretty significant for the U.S. Um, and for Europe. But... Uh, aggregate numbers are great, 
they need to be stress tested against an understanding of what's happening commercially in re reality in the Chinese economy that suddenly leads a country that was sending abroad <coughs> practically nothing just a few years ago to seriously consider sending trillions of its hard-earned forex abroad via its firms in just seven or eight years ahead. Let's take a, a minute here just to try to understand what some of the drivers um, might be. I'm going to um, uh, mention to you about seven of them. The first is that compared to the first 20 years of China's op uh, reform and opening up, where firms were growing their profitability in China, uh, just by increasing the scale of manufacturing activity, making more socks and underwear, right? Not necessarily doing the high value added stuff of designing little cute little alligator logos to go on the socks um, or shirts or what have you, right? Well, that era is over. We now have sufficient scale in Chinese manufacturing that profit margins are shrinking, you know, getting smaller. So much so that in fact many firms in some parts of Guangdong are shutting down and going to Vietnam. We're going to inland China, so some of it will be retained in China for a new generation of poorer provinces <coughs> to help provision. Don't mind the alliteration there. Um, much of it will go abroad to lower income economies. So that's one driver. That's one reason to move your activity outside China in order to stay in the same business. A second factor, which doesn't get very much attention actually, is the role of currency appreciation over the past five or six years. There have been profound increases. Uh, changes in Chinese operating costs. One of them is the strengthening of the renminbi <coughs> against dollar and euro and other currencies. We don't remember it well now, but that $1.5 trillion of FDI inside China, it started with a single starting gun, firing gun, and that was our success in forcing the Japanese to imp uh, appreciate the yen against the dollar. And there followed in turn the new Taiwan dollar, the Korean won, and other uh, Asian tiger uh, currencies. <laughs> with the rise, structural uh, manufacturing cost rise of our successful currency pressure on, on the Tigers, they shut down in Japan and Korea and Taiwan and moved operations to China, right? And gave us the China boom that we saw subsequent to 87 when the big uh, mid-80s Plaza Accord and Louvre Accord agreements um, were achieved. We have now had five, six years, seven years of Chinese currency appreciation and part of the uh, relative attraction now of assets in America, in Europe, to a Chinese buyer arises from the 20, 25, 30 percent strengthening of currency, depending on which currency you're, you're looking at, versus what was the case previously. The third factor is, of course, sheer strategic mm -hmm. urgency. After you've spent 30 years on the kind of fixed asset investment boom that China has undertaken, mm -hmm. you build yourself into a kind of structural economy that requires that you retain your position in foreign markets, for one thing, that you've built up for many years, that you have a better position in acquiring natural resources mm -hmm. overseas, that you've been building into your economic structure and your five-year plans uh, year after year, decade after decade for, for three decades. So there's an urgency to go out there and defend the model by having outposts abroad mm -hmm. that wasn't there just a few years ago. Fourthly, compared to even mid-2000s, China increasingly now has the capacity to go abroad and do these sorts of things, by which I mean managers, professionals, who can speak some foreign languages, who understand what it means to operate um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a marketplace where there's such a thing as sexual harassment law which no Chinese executive ever uh, would understand had they not been abroad and take it seriously as needs. I mean, I, I, I suggest something which seems, you know, trivial in comparison of many other things, but there's a thousand such basic norms of operating in Peoria, which somebody from Wuhan hasn't the faintest idea about. But today, compared to the past, there are vast in increase in the capacity to do these sorts of things. Nextly, defensive moves defensive moves. From the Chinese perspective, there are many segments, there are many industries where they perceive themselves to be in a disadvantageous position in terms of market power, whether it's the uh, availability of iron ore in the world or computer chips, many things. Chinese firms find themselves um, uh, incentivized to go out and take uh, sometimes just uh, a strategic defensive position in firms so that they can have a little bit more influence over the market structure that they confront. Uh, two more factors to mention, one which is almost you know, not polite to, to talk about 
yet, and at, at, a, at a dicey moment like this one, but there's an aspect of the extraordinary recent growth in Chinese outflows, which is probably easily understood as capital flight, as capital flight, which could be a matter of anxiety about China's near-term economic outlook. It could be a very personal anxiety on the part of, say, some former government officials unsure of whether their ill-got gains can be protected from the scrutiny of the party, the Central Disciplinary Commission, journalists, or uh, unscrupulous foreign consultants trying to blackmail them and want to diversify and want to diversify their risks by taking some of that wealth out of the country and perhaps investing in real estate or going concerns um, in other parts of the world. And then finally, uh, I just got back from Europe releasing a new study on this topic and a tremendous, the tremendous head of global M&A for CICC, China International Capital Corporation, uh, was, was with us on, on the release of a new study. And I was reminded of just how important it is that China now has investment bankers of its own doing what investment bankers everywhere do. They get uh, the people who run real economy companies all hot and bothered and excited about the prospect of going out and using their uh, time and money to uh, make acquisitions and strengthen their market, <coughs> market position by being more aggressive and more cosmopolitan around the world. All of these things um, are, part, are, are, are critical parts of the drive to, uh, by Chinese firms to have a greater international role. I I'll tell you, I think almost none of them are obvious to policymakers in Washington or in Brussels who are much more inclined to see the growth of Chinese outbound investment as some kind of politicized uh, story um, that needs a careful national security screening. Now, there are industries which are inevitably going to get that screening, but to mistake this largely commercial story as a predominantly political one is a grave error and one which I think all of us whether we're looking at this from a policy perspective or even from a business perspective, um, need to do still further work getting to understand and know what's happening in China in order to make sure we understand what our opportunities are and what they aren't. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to make a two uh, um, propositions instead of seven. The first is... Uh, um, I think there might actually be a unique model um, of Chinese FDI, o ODI, or um, ODI, ODI model with a very strong Chinese characteristic. But the second proposition is, um, I think while the, the Chinese characteristics might actually stay for a long time, or for at least a while, uh, we are about to see major changes in the model. Um, just in short, I think we might see a new wave of uh, private sector or private um, sector manufacturers moving into um, the international economy in the coming decade. Um, the first, well, you look at the Chinese investment and there are lots of discussions about a unique feature. Um, you often heard the number one, uh, China is already the fifth largest investor in the world, which is very unique because China is still a 5,000 uh, US dollar GDP per capita economy, and that's very unusual. Normally, you only export capital when you, becomes, uh, much richer, you, you, when you become much richer. Um, so this is a bit unique. The second unique feature is um, most of the Chinese investors, at least as we heard, are state-owned companies. So state sector accounts for something like 70%. In, in value terms of total um, Chinese ODI. But I think really the most important characteristic of Chinese ODI, if you, look, if you compare with many other ODI, is uh, what I call investing overseas but without in, uh, moving your factories abroad. Now, when you look at most of um, the FDI, ODI or FDI, you will find that whoever makes investment overseas, they really move the factory uh, production facilities overseas. I um, mean, for different purposes, so what uh, um, I might characterize the Japanese-style investment overseas, taking advantage of the low cost in the host countries or the so-called American-style um, investment overseas really to enter the market or to overcome the entry barriers. Um, but uh, of course, I have to say, if you look at any single country, it got to be very mixed. So uh, uh, we can't really see American investment is American-style 
or um, Japanese investment, Japanese study. So just for the sake of distinction, I'm using these terms, and I think it is even some of you would notice the Japanese style investment is changing and the last 20 years is converging into more like um, American style investment. So why are Chinese companies making investment overseas but still keep their companies at home, um, factories at home? And I think the key reason is to, to understand this is really to, to, to look at development of the technology and the levels of um, cost. Most countries move their factories overseas because they're losing cost advantage at home. So, for instance, Japanese companies moved to China in the 1980s. Um, they remain competitive because if they stay at home, they will no longer be competitive. But in China, most of these companies, well, the Chinese cost to some extent still um, had some advantages. So it doesn't make sense, for instance, for the Chinese companies to move to Europe or to America today because the costs are much lower. But you have lots of foreign exchange and you need to, um, to, to improve your competitiveness. So that's why the main, main motivations are either to acquire resources, to buy strategic assets, or to, um, to, to set up companies to facilitate your exports. Now, the strategic assets can be very broadly defined. Technology, management, brand names, marketing networks, and so on. But the single purpose of all these various activities is not to shift your factories away from your home, but to strengthen or to improve competitiveness of your factories at home. And the precondition, obviously, as I said, is you still have a cost advantage and you want to improve your technology. I might actually take a step further if I'm brave, brave enough to propose maybe a life cycle um, of ODI. When you're a very poor country, if you can invest, you don't move your factory, so you use the Chinese style. You're trying to make investment overseas, acquire some assets, and strengthen your competitiveness. When you re your costs reach certain level, you start to move out because you can no longer stay there. This was the case in the 1980s with the businesses in Hong Kong, in uh, Korea, and in Taiwan. They all moved their garments factories to China. Now, they stayed in China for quite a while now. Um, and the main purpose is to take cost advantage. At certain stage, I think when you move to the levels like many large multinational companies, uh, cost may, may less be relevant, and then entry barrier becomes more critical. So there might be a, a, a sequencing of the movement of these uh, different style models or, or characteristics. But again, I would certainly say um, this is, um, it, it's kind of mixed if you look at one economy. You can't really have a very clear cut from one to the other. Um, the final point uh, um, I also want to mention here is that the Chinese style investment is not just unique in China. Historically, we saw very similar uh, phenomena in many other countries. Japan in the 60s, 70s, Korea in the 70s, 80s, and Brazil and many other countries, they also make investment overseas, acquiring resources, acquiring strategic assets, or maybe to facilitate your exports. But they were never um, such a major phenomenon like China is today. I guess that's because either because China is a large country and most other countries didn't really have the kind of foreign exchange resources <coughs> to do that. That's why it's mostly significant in China. The second proposition, as I mentioned, I think we're about to see changes. The reason is that the cost of production has been rising very quickly. So, um, so we start to see some migration of the factories in China, mainly from coastal area to inland provinces. But already we saw many of the factories move to Southeast Asia and many South Asian countries. And I think even for, for these, uh, these factories move to inland provinces, as we know, the costs are rising very quickly even there. So there is an open question how long they can stay there. The difference between China and Korea, for instance, is obviously Korea is a small country. When you reach a certain cost level, everything moves out, maybe within a couple of years. For China, you can rotate around quite a bit, but eventually you still have to leave. And that's why I think we are going to see a new wave. But there are a couple of other changes we probably need to keep in mind. For instance, financial liberalization. 
The government is considering capital account liberalization, but the first step, I think, is liberalization of ODI. That would probably reduce lots of restrictions and barriers for most companies, not just the state companies. Um, I think the cost is rising. It's quite obvious. The wage is probably most significant. But energy cost, the land cost, and probably capital cost are also rising. And finally, we might actually also see some further steps to reform the state sector. So the next wave, if we do see ODI coming up, and as many already mentioned, it might become a major phenomenon. It might actually look very different from in the past. And my very bold prediction is if SOE investment was the main headache for you, maybe the next big step we have to really to be prepared is lots of Chinese private sector manufacturers <laughs> will come to the uh, global market. And, uh, but that also poses a challenge. While I think it's always a change in division of labor is good, but sometimes it, it does impose a cost for um, adjustment. And we, we do recognize there are some issues we have to recognize. The Chinese SOEs, there are always issues with their motivation, with their strategic purpose, and so on. My own assessment, obviously, is they most, in most cases, they behave just like ordinary um, corporate sector. But obviously, there are questions there. So, while this is going to become a major phenomenon in the global market, it does require China to take steps to um, reform many of um, its own economy and, and, and the companies. But I think that this is a two-way street. Even if China takes substantial steps to liberalize and to reform, China will not become another U.S. even in 10, 20, or 50 years. And so if China is going to become a major phenomenon, I think China has to adapt to the international system, but maybe the international community at some stage also has to, has to recognize that the Chinese way maybe is a part of the global reality. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Yi Ping. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm not going to share with you uh, lots of... Um, stats and numbers and <coughs> prognoses on how things are going to go. Um, we're really just um, quite simple miners, but we've had a lot of exposure to China <laughs> over a long period of time. Um, Rio Tinto, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a major diversified mining house, and it's one of the very few companies in the world that has had direct experience of Chinese investment in both developed and in developing countries. One of China's first major foreign investments was with Rio Tinto in a project called the Chan'a Joint Venture with Sino Steel that was established back in 1987 to develop an iron ore project deposit in, uh, in Western Australia. That, that single project helped define the model for Chinese direct investment in foreign resource projects. And we've since refined it through further joint ventures with Bow Steel again in iron ore in Western Australia and with Chalco in Guinea. And indeed, we've recently um, uh, undertaken an exploration, to commence an exploration joint venture on, on a regional basis inside China. In 2009, Rio Tinto also became the object of one of China's largest ever foreign investments when Chinalco acquired 9% of our issued capital for $17 billion to become our single largest shareholder. Contrary to, uh, to conspiracy theories that circulate regarding the motives of China Inc., in making these investments, our experience suggests that the reality is indeed quite benign. In fact, the motives of the Chinese companies investing in our projects around the world are not dissimilar to those of Rio Tinto. They seek to maximise returns for their shareholders in a sustainable fashion, uh, and they seek to mitigate their risk through diversification across a range of different countries and of different commodities. As their major shareholder is the state, their activities do need to be aligned with China's national interests to secure approval and additional funding for proposed transactions. SASAC, the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission, has recently introduced new measures for managing offshore investments by SOEs under its supervision. Those measures are driven by concerns familiar to any Western shareholder they want to protect their capital 
and to improve shareholder returns by ensuring that it is invested wisely. Ultimately, SASAC and the State Council also want to ensure that their investment by those SOEs is in the best interests of the Chinese people on whose behalf they invest those funds. The State is acting to further its own interests, but then so are we. The mistake is to assume that those interests are mutually exclusive and that we are competitors in a zero-sum game. There are plenty of areas where those areas coincide and where those interests can be aligned for mutual benefit. China has a strong interest in maintaining a secure supply of the resources it requires to fuel continued development with its own borders. Over the past 30 years, it has successfully raised more than 200 million people to a relatively affluent middle class and the standard of living. However, there are still more than a billion people waiting for their turn. Sharing the benefits of development with those people will require continued urbanisation and industrialisation, which in turn will require a secure supply of energy and raw materials. Direct investment in foreign resource projects helps China to fund <coughs> the development of additional supply and diversify its range of suppliers, thus improving its overall resource security whilst reducing price volatility. And from the perspective of a supplier or a host country, Chinese investment provides a much needed source of capital in a global economy where that is an increasingly scarce and expensive commodity. It helps fund the infrastructure and provide the skilled workforce that they require to develop their natural resources and benefit from the actual growth in Chinese demand. The extent of that demand for resources and the speed with which it grew caused, caught most people by surprise. It quickly consumed any surplus production capacity, sparking a race between suppliers around the world to bring new capacity online to meet the needs of China. The fact that everyone started doing this at much the same time led to fierce competition for scarce commodities such as skilled workers, equipment and investment capital. And this in turn has led to dramatic cost increases which now in some cases threaten the commercial viability of many projects, particularly those in the developed countries. As a result, projects in developing countries are often in developing countries are now often more attractive investment projects. This applies to the decision making of both Rio Tinto and the Chinese SOEs and has affected our assessment of country risk and our allocation of investment capital between developed and developing countries. There is also a perception that China, in China, that the best opportunities in the developed world are already taken and to some extent this is obviously true. While there are still plenty of world-class mineral deposits that remain undeveloped in countries like Australia, the US and Canada, they are increasingly expensive and difficult to develop and existing infrastructure is often stretched to capacity. So despite the quality of the resources, new projects can become commercially difficult due to high costs and local opposition to development. In the case of Chinese companies, this is exacerbated by the sense of suspicion with which they are greeted in many Western countries. Australia is no exception to this. Despite Australia being the largest single destination for foreign direct Chinese investment, there is a perception in China that our foreign investment rules are stacked against Chinese SOEs and the public response to Chinese investment is completely out of proportion to the size or impact of that investment. Developing countries are not without their concerns regarding Chinese investment either, particularly with regard to labour practices and environmental protection, but in many ways these are easier to address. It creates considerable opportunities for large companies like Rio Tinto with complementary strengths in these areas to work in partnership with Chinese companies on new projects. We share our operational experience and expertise in such areas as safety, environmental management and sustainable development, whilst our Chinese partners bring access to investment capital and world-class expertise in construction, infrastructure development and manufacturing. Our Simindu joint venture model with Chalco in Guinea that I mentioned earlier is a prime example of this model. 
and working with Chalco and a consortia of leading Chinese companies allows us to develop the project quickly and efficiently as possible and at a competitive cost without compromising our high standards of safety, environmental protection and sustainable development. By expediting development, we're meeting the needs of the host country for jobs, infrastructure and an early revenue stream. We're also meeting the needs of China for additional sources of supply and new export options for its equipment and its service providers. Support from the host country and the end market reduces project risk for the joint venture partners, as does support from the local community due to the high standards under which the projects are operated. So just as the Chan'er project helped define the model for Chinese direct investment in developed nations and gave Australia a head start as a destination for that investment, we hope that the Simindu model plays a similar role in developing nations for the mutual benefit of all those involved. Thank you. Okay, the uh, first uh, three speakers uh, have set the stage. So I will just uh, come to a more specific uh, uh, topic uh, uh, that is uh, uh, the role of SOEs and the government uh, in China's ODI. Um, to be sure, uh, as uh, Yi Ping just uh, uh, Dan also said, uh, uh, SOEs uh, are heavily present in China's ODI and we cannot just ignore this issue. Uh, so I will first talk a little bit uh, about my understanding why SOEs have been a large uh, player in China's ODI and also then talk about the two issues uh, related to that. I think the first is just uh, pure money. Uh, uh, China has accumulated a huge amount of foreign reserve and on the other hand, if we look at the SOE's balance sheet, uh, they have ripped a huge amount of profits. Uh, adding an SOE uh, sector together mm -hmm. might be 1.5 to 1.8 trillion RMB each year. And uh, most of the m profits uh, have been returned by SOE's. The government does not take the m profits away. So on a purely commercial base, uh, those SOEs uh, have to find ways to reinvest the, uh, their profits. And second, I think uh, here history is very important. Uh, if you look at uh, the, 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 the age of Chinese private firms, most of them are very, very young, like uh, Huawei here, uh, 25 year, years old. Right? But if you look at the other uh, state companies, uh, they have had uh, a 50 years uh, uh, history, like uh, the company I worked, I used to work uh, uh, in Xi'an. It was established uh, uh, at the end of the 1950s. It, at the highest point, it had 11 factories and seven research institutes. Uh, today, it's still a huge uh, uh, state-owned corporation. And its uh, technology is much more advanced than, than most uh, private firms in the same area that is in electric uh, transportation, right? So uh, that's uh, just the nature for SOEs uh, to go abroad first. And third, I think it's also uh, long reliable that uh, it's much easier for SOEs uh, to get the credits. Uh, it's not because that the government uh, gave uh, uh, or intentionally gave SOEs cheaper credits, it's just a, SOEs uh, have uh, a large amount of assets, especially uh, real estate assets, so they can either provide the collaterals to get bank loans. So those are kind of uh, the advantages of SOEs, and uh, that also, I think, explain why SOEs uh, uh, are heavily present in China's ODI. Uh, but what about the, the role of the government? I mean, uh, of course, uh, the Chinese government uh, has uh, a strategy, right? It's uh, not reliable if I say, no, the government is not behind the SOE. I'm not honest. Uh, the Chinese government, of course, is behind the SOEs. But what are the intentions? Uh, I mean, in the West, uh, especially, I think, in European countries, uh, people suspect that the Chinese government has a grand strategy 
to buy out uh, the whole world, to buy out the West, you know, even to control uh, the world through SOEs. I don't, uh, I think that's uh, uh, very, very overfetching. Uh, if uh, the Chinese government has a strategy, I would just say uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, to help uh, domestic economic growth, right? Uh, China is a growing economy. China is uh, also a huge uh, growing economy. Uh, currently, China's uh, production of uh, steel is uh, 600 million. I think uh, it can be easily doubled. By international standards, it should be doubled. That sounds like a crazy, uh, but we'll see. I think it's going to reach that figure. And that uh, demands a huge amount of iron ore. Right. Uh, and also other other minerals and uh, oil. Right. So uh, the Chinese government, uh, for the sake of uh, domestic economic growth, uh, has to form some kind of a strategy uh, to secure the supply of energy and mineral. It, it's, I don't think that there is any difference between what uh, the Chinese government is doing and the Japanese government uh, did uh, 20 years ago. A second strategy, actually, which uh, this is also quite controversial, is if you look at uh, China's uh, uh, investment, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, especially st uh, state firms, uh, tend to operate in those unstable countries, or, or unstable in the sense that uh, politically or militarily you know, divided countries. And uh, this is only because the best uh, markets have been occupied by Western companies, like oil com uh, you know, of course, uh, all the companies want to go to safe places, right? But there's not much room for China. And so Chinese uh, companies have to go to quite unstable countries. And for, for the sake of that, the Chinese government has to go there and sign agreements uh, with uh, those recipient countries. Okay, so I, I think uh, uh, in the end, uh, the strategy of the Chinese government is just uh, to uh, support China's domestic economic growth. Then the, the, the questions uh, 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 were natural uh, uh, too. Uh, one, uh, whether uh, the SOEs will become kind of uh, a tool for the Chinese government to, to reach some strategic goals, especially in the, in the West, in the United States in particular, uh, to get the sensitive technologies. Uh, I would say, I mean, to obtain technology is just the nature for a company from the urban country, right? uh, because uh, uh, our companies do not have advanced technologies, and to acquire more advanced technologies uh, it's just uh, one important goal. Um, but this is uh, just a universal, not just a Chinese companies. And if you look at the SOEs, many of them are listed companies, right? So if you tackle with those uh, CEOs of uh, 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 SOEs, you're going to find that they're going to say, hey, we just uh, behave like uh, any other commercial companies in the world. And the second question, I think it's, also more serious question is whether uh, SOEs will spread the so-called Chinese model of governance uh, because of the success, economic success of China. Uh, or uh, other developing countries will learn uh, the, or adopt uh, China's uh, governance model. I would just say first, uh, uh, that's a wrong summary of China's economic success. Uh, in the last 30 years, China has succeeded economically not because China has a strong government. It's just uh, the reverse. It's because uh, the state has constantly retreated from the society and uh, from the economy. Otherwise, uh, China would have succeeded uh, before 1978. Right, China didn't. So that's a, that's a wrong, wrong lesson to learn from China, I would say. And market, uh, uh, market reform 
as being the key for China's e economic success. And the second, I would say, uh, China has no intention to spread the so-called China model. And you can see you know, China does not impose uh, that kind of con uh, conditionality on the China's investment. And also his history mat matters, right? Uh, China uh, started uh, uh, th this model is because, just because of China's recent uh, history. Right? We cannot change the history overnight. And I also say for other developing countries, uh, it's not that easy to adopt the so-called China model just because of their own uh, history. So uh, all in all, I would just say uh, the worries of the world, uh, some of them uh, 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 were founded, but um, I would say most of them uh, based on just a perception, not reality. Stop. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, in fact, it's good morning where I come from, uh, Johannesburg. I was complaining about this a moment ago to Doug Ritchie. He said uh, it was actually half past eight in the morning where he was from. Uh, it's half past one in the morning where I'm from. I said, what is he complaining about? He should be bright and fresh and ready to go. It's half past eight in the morning. Anyway, um, it's a great pleasure to be here and at this public session and thank you both to the organizers and to Columbia University for hosting us. Um, I wondered if Jeffrey Sachs was still here. Uh, maybe, he's, maybe he's evaporated with global warming or something. <laughs> there is a danger, of course, uh, and I said this earlier in the private session, of overanalyzing everything to do with China. Uh, we act on so little information, and I'll return to this point in a second. There's a danger that we take the information that we have available, which is often second or third hand, a lot of it based on hyperbole or on urban legend, uh, and we try and make sense of it. Uh, and so this, con this uh, conference is a great contribution towards digging a bit deeper uh, into some of the statistics that we have. Uh, the other health warning I want to give you right at the outset is that uh, I have spent a lot of time in my career in Afghanistan as an advisor to various commanders, which may account for some of the lack of success. Um, <laughs> but one thing I have learnt much uh, to my own cost and chagrin in Afghanistan is the importance of never trying to uh, understand people through the stereotypes that are portrayed in the media. And nowhere is this more true than in Afghanistan, and it's often very true of the Chinese in Africa. I can't speak about other regions, but that they are a certain thing to Africans, and I think that is completely wrong. I think uh, they act according to incentives and disincentives just the same way that us Africans would uh, if placed in a similar situation in China. And so, again, a very important contribution to dig underneath the cliches and stereotypes in this regard. Um, Africa has had its best, best growth decade on record over the 2000s, uh, and this has largely been driven by higher commodity prices. Uh, and we owe the Chinese a great debt in this regard uh, in a number of respects. It's also due to improvements in technology uh, and in governance. In 1980, I'm reminded, there were two African democracies. Uh, today, of course, there are more than 40 African countries which regularly hold multi-party elections. So we've had our own part to play in getting things a little bit better, not least in my own country, South Africa. With this backdrop in mind, I want to make five points. I'm a social scientist, so I can't really count beyond ten, so I'll limit it to five. Uh, I was also trained as a lawyer, Doug, so that may be account for that too. Um, the first is, is just to stress this point of the tremendous opportunity that uh, China has offered Africa. At the start of his, uh, I think, reign as president of France, uh, I was asked to go to the LSE to, uh, Elise, sorry, to um, uh, a brief a member of President Sarkozy's Africa team, uh, comprised one person at the time, um, uh, showed where the importance of the continent rested, and he very succinctly s summed up uh, France's changing relationship with the African continent. He said in terms of three statistics, they were 5, 14, and 1.6. 
I scratched my head a little bit. I said, I'm only a social scientist. And I said, well, please explain the relevance of these three statistics. He said, five was the age of Mr. Sarkozy. You remember him? Short fellow, beautiful wife. Um, when President Chirac, his predecessor, was fighting in the Algerian Civil War. In other words, he was of a different generation, not informed by the same prejudice of the past. Fourteen is the distance in kilometers across the Strait of Gibraltar. The point being that what happened in Africa inevitably affected Europe and vice versa. And 1.6 billion, he said, was the population of, of Africa, its entirety, by the year 2020. The implication being this was a large market. This was uh, something that the French wanted part of. And he said, very importantly, that the role of China in, in Africa had changed France's views on the continent from no longer being a problem to be solved, but to being a partnership and an opportunity to be entered into. And I do think that uh, China has, because of its own internal demands, not through any charity of its own or philanthropy, changed that impression of Africa. And of course, Africa, as I've already said, through its own governance regimes, have also, has also contributed to that. But what do we understand, secondly, then about China in Africa? And shorthand for this, we, we take summits, particularly heads of state summits, of which there are far too many, and we heard a moment ago of how many there are just in the next week or two. We take summits as being a key indicator of the health of the relationship between China and Africa. We also take a whole range of statistics, but clearly there's much more at stake here. What we do know is there has been a rapid and sudden increase and a change in the nature of the engagement of uh, China with the African continent. Uh, it has occurred especially in the 2000s, but has been slowly ramping up since the mid-1990s as China's own domestic demands have uh, driven its engagement with the African continent. Uh, investment is about 40 billion US dollars in total now, uh, from a total FDI stock in Africa of around 850 billion dollars. Uh, Two-way trade is about $150 billion uh, from virtually zero just 15 years ago. There are at least a million Chinese folk living in Africa today. Uh, and China e imports about 1.5 million barrels of oil per day. And that is steadily rising as many of its investments come on stream. So these statistics paint a particular picture, but it's very important to disaggregate this picture of China in Africa. It's very important to disaggregate or differentiate Africa as a whole. Africa, after all, is 55 different countries, north and south of the Sahara, 49 south of the Sahara today. Different sizes, different shapes, uh, some landlocked, some double landlocked, uh, some performers, some reformers, some big states, some small states, some very fragile states, some failed states a very disaggregated picture and a whole different taxonomy should emerge from that. And in that, of course, a number of those different categories of states are themselves blessed, or some would say cursed, uh, with minerals in the process. But the picture of China's engagement with Africa is very different as well. It is not one thing. It is not state-owned enterprises. There are state-owned enterprises which are slowly losing their state ownership. There are those, of course, big state-owned enterprises, particularly in the mineral sector, among some of the big deal makers. Uh, there are, of course, a range of construction industries, some with state linkages, some with not. Some bidding for Chinese contracts or Chinese aid-related contracts, some bidding just for contracts which are out there. They may be funded by the World Bank or the IMF or the African Development Bank or by bilateral donors. They operate in their own uh, uh, um, in their own environment. And of course, the human face of China in Africa is very much the large numbers of Chinese traders, many millions, I would argue, ab above the figure of just a million, many million, millions of people who are trading in some of the rural areas and some of the urban areas of Africa um, who present the interface, as it were, the contact point between Africa's people uh, and, and the, 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 the presence of China in Africa. As an institution, we recently conducted a five-country, 200-interview study of Chinese traders uh, in, Afri in southern African countries. And the results are very revealing. I don't really have time here to share all of them with you, 
but generally speaking, these folk have found their own way to Africa. These are not part of any major governmental drive. They have no relationship to speak of with the host government, nor do they have any relationship to speak of with Beijing either. Uh, they regard their relationship with Beijing uh, as being extremely distant. Most of them, uh, more than half of them, were from one single province of China, which accentuates the importance of familial linkages in these processes. And it just is a dip into understanding uh, a phenomena in Africa about which, as I've said, we only have statistics to try and prove uh, the point we're trying to make. But how does this help to solve Africa's uh, ongoing and upcoming challenges? Um, the two questions we have is, will this commodity boom, which China has been, a key, has been a key part of, will it be different this time for Africa? Will it leave behind infrastructure uh, and better government uh, and better systems uh, and more benefit to the fiscus rather than to individual bank accounts? Will this boom time be different? Will it last longer even perhaps for Africa uh, and leave more behind? And then the perhaps more profound question, which is, as unit costs rise in China, Will Africa be able to become the next China? Will we be having a conference at Columbia University in 15 years' time about the presence uh, of, uh, of African uh, manufacturing industries in the American market or perhaps uh, even in the Chinese market and what the Chinese are going to do about the, the uh, presence of, uh, and the threat of African industry in their marketplace? And I think this is a very important question for, for Africa because we have this enormous stock of youthful people within uh, our communities. Some two-thirds of our population are under the age of 25. In fact, one in four young people in the world by 2025, uh, those people under the age of 25, will be from sub-Saharan Africa. By 2025, more than 50% of them will be living in Africa's cities. So clearly we have an enormous pressure uh, to do something in terms of providing jobs uh, for this group of young people, uh, many of whom whose expectations are informed by the world outside and many of whom currently find themselves uh, unemployment or in what the ILO calls vulnerable employment. In other words, self-employed. More than 80% of sub-Saharan Africans find themselves in vulnerable employment at the moment. To change the fortunes of this cohort of young people and of Africa's current generations, we of course need foreign direct investment. Our savings rates are only about 10%, those in China are four times that amount, and clearly we need a chunk of that capital. Uh, we also need to raise our growth rates. Our growth rates in the 2000s were around 5%, as I've said, the best growth decade on record. But 5% growth uh, is going to double your per capita income, 5% real growth, going to double your per capita income in 15 years. We need more like 10% growth, because in 15 years' time, we can't afford to still be very poor people, albeit twice as wealthy as we are today. So we have to drive our growth rates upward, and to do that, clearly, we need to improve skills, we need to provide the sort of secure and predictable environments that investors want to operate in, and we need, among, uh, uh, perhaps beyond all else, to improve uh, the hard infrastructure, particularly electrification and energy, some of the things that Professor Sachs touched on, uh, and China has a key role and has already played a key role in providing some of those long-term assets. So if we are thinking strategically about the nature of that partnership, it's not just about extraction, it's also about getting as much as possible uh, out of the Chinese uh, in that partnership. And of course this is made more imperative by the fact that commodity prices will go down uh, uh, at some point in the future, uh, yet the job crisis will continue. And let me end then with three sets of recommendations which were, we were forced to think about in the last session uh, during our conference. And I have recommendations for Africa, because this is a, a global audience. I have recommendations for the West, since this is where we are located, and for China, uh, because uh, this is what we are discussing. I think for the West, I think from what we have seen in Africa is that China seeks exactly what you do in operating in the African continent. Uh, it wants its operators want credibility and reliability of supply and partnerships, and it's very necessary to cut out the hyperbole, the chauvinism, and the cliches in understanding China in Africa, at least from our vantage. For China, I think it's very important uh, to remember that history shows 
Africa has a way of resisting and ultimately rejecting any sort of imperialist notions um, and that good governance regimes are useful as the West has learned for guaranteeing investments whether they be from China uh, or from the West. And then finally for my countrymen uh, and continent men and women, uh, I, think, I don't think we should expect China or anyone else for that matter, despite their stated intentions, to act according to our, to our interests. They're going to act according or in their own interests. And it's very important for us to get our house in order, to take a very nuanced, disaggregated view of China, uh, and to try and get as much out of this relationship over the long-term horizon as is possible. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have uh, more questions than time, so I will try to choose uh, a couple of quick, quick key questions, and I think most of us will stay there after for uh, a glass of wine where you'll have, be able to maybe uh, interact with the uh, speakers individually and ask them more specific questions. And I guess the first question I'd like maybe uh, uh, some of you uh, to reflect on is... Uh, Professor Sachs' observation that, in fact, that there are three possible outcomes that are associated with uh, the rise of China. <coughs> One was, uh, if you recall, the balance of power, kind of a peaceful power influence, uh, mutual recognition and respect. The second one was a competitive model, a model in which there is geopolitical competition, there is competition for natural resources, this economic competition, there's perhaps even military confrontation, for example, in the South China Sea. And the third model was one that I think was a wish list, which is a close global cooperation in which both China and the U.S. will work closely together to solve the world's problems. Probably the most likely outcome is that the two nations will be competing against one another in the global arena of resources, markets, and power. I was, wanted to ask some of you, all of you have come up with different projections, and if you can just say two sentences, how would that influence if, in fact, economic and political confrontation will be the outcome of the growth of China, how is that going to affect the growth of Chinese OFDI? We'll start with you, Daniel. Oui. Um, okay. Well, I'm I'm talking in between people on a glass of wine in a warm room. Um, uh, I, I'll simply say this: that um, never before in uh, China's modern history, since 1949, have the consequences of poor Chinese political security uh, and other policy-making decisions at home um, been susceptible to capital outflight. Right? So now China has started this process of going abroad in strength, but that also can affect China um, in, in terms of weakness, uh, right? Um, that uh, firms can take their money and go abroad if they're not comfortable with the policy choices made at home. So I think it's a constraint, ultimately, on, um, uh, on poor behavior. Um. I think uh, tensions are likely when uh, two um, superpowers co learn to coexist in the world, but I don't really expect a major confrontation between the two countries, and I think there are lots of economic stake, lots of communication um, and, and exchange. I think the stakes are too high. My own expectation is that uh, um, the system has to change, but uh, on the Chinese side, it has uh, recognized for long that the current system is uh, very good for the Chinese growth and uh, we, we want to be a part of it. But we also want to change because now um, if the current system was originally designed and established by the developed world, now um, it has also to accommodate um, the developing world which are becoming a much great <coughs> bigger part of the world. So a simplest term I often like to use uh, was uh, um, the international ex economic system has to change from a family business to shareholding system. Yeah, I, I probably don't have anything anything serious to add. I, I actually agree very much with with what Yi Ping says, that that and 
an evolutionary rise of China is going to force some change around the world, but it doesn't have to be a clash of systems in the, in the sense that you'd postulate. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as I think I remember a word, uh, kind of new word uh, called competition. Of course, uh, there is competition between the United States and China. Uh, but uh, in this uh, new age of globalization, I think competition will lead those two countries uh, to have more cooperation. And in terms of uh, ODI, uh, I really don't think uh, there will be any conflicts uh, between those two countries uh, when the United States invests in China, uh, China welcomes. Uh, and uh, in, uh, this time, when Chinese investments come to the United States, um, most of places uh, also work on uh, 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 Chinese uh, investments. And also, uh, in other parts of the world, uh, China basically goes to where the United States uh, uh, does not go, right? Uh, as it stops going. So I really don't think uh, that's going to create uh, much tension between those two countries. I'm coming at the end of a long line of people here, but uh, there's an old African <laughs> there's an old African proverb: uh, when two elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Uh, and we are sometimes the grass in this regard. I mean, I think overall, uh, despite the United States' defence posture or increasing alignment in that regard, despite the fact uh, of there's been cyber warfare, and you can classify them as cyber warfare occurrences, uh, I think competition's good. Uh, I think competition drives prices up, it drives interests up. Obviously, if that competition remains uh, relatively benign, that's important. I think the important point to make about China in Africa, and I'm not going to venture a comment on any other region, is that the, the Chinese in Africa are doing things that American folk are not doing, uh, that Europeans did 60, 70, 80 years ago, my grandfather and his ancestors did, built infrastructure in rural areas, operated small trading stores, worked manually to get uh, uh, extractive industries going, very physical work. They're doing things that I'm afraid the West doesn't do anymore. Uh, and I, I think there is a division of labor there, to use Jeffrey Sachs's term, in a very crude sense, um, at one level, not every level, because clearly this is, a, as I said, a highly differentiated mm. picture. So the notion that somehow there's competition at every level, I think, is just plain forward, simple, wrong. And I do think that overall competition will help to, to spark a bit more uh, competitiveness in the approach of potential partners. This question is for actually two questions for Mr. Ritchie. Uh, a few people were writing about the, the very famous case uh, in which... Uh, a few members of your company got arrested in China <laughs> and wondered how that affects the Chinese uh, perceptions of Chinese OFDI and whether in fact there is a kind of uh, danger of reciprocity in Australia for these kind of uh, actions. <laughs> and the second question is relating to renewable energy. Perhaps you can uh, uh, talk a little bit about what actions uh, China has taken to make development and resource extraction more uh, sustainable. Yeah, look, on, on the, first, the first question, um, I, I don't think that uh, anyone in China nor in Australia views the actions of, of four people as being representative either of, of an entire country or or the way in which um, whole groups of people do business. It was a very unfortunate, in, in a very unfortunate incident. Um, and uh, we, we as an organisation, uh, in, our, in our interactions with China, have, uh, have remained consistent to the values that we've always had, and I, and I think that that is reciprocated by China. Um, and I, as I say, I, I just don't see it being, being an action that's a tit for tat in any way as being, uh, as being of benefit to, to any other nation state. Uh, on renewables, I, 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 in my capacity as sort of group executive responsible for China, I, I do get to travel around the place a reasonable amount. I certainly get to engage an awful lot with their in energy policy, policy makers and the organisations that are responsible for carrying it out. 
And the one observation that I would make is that uh, it, China um, treats energy in all its forms as being of immense strategic importance. Uh, in terms of picking and choosing between energy types, they are not doing that. They are, they, are, they are pursuing all forms of energy, renewables included. They have a very, very strong nuclear campaign going and uh, lots, of, lots of solar, huge advances in battery technology. Uh, it's, it's a country which has got uh, a lot of uh, technology and a lot of money that's going into it. So I think that uh, that's going to be quite beneficial for the rest of the world as well. Okay, thank you. As concluding remarks, uh, some of you have, uh, a couple of you have asked the question about the analogies that we've made. And uh, in particular, Professor Sachs has made the analogy of Russia, that China is like uh, Russia during the Cold War. Uh, in our earlier conference uh, today, we talked about uh, Japan as perhaps the, the example we could use in order to model uh, OFDI, ODI behavior. Uh, and many people have alluded uh, to East Asian countries. It is my opinion that, in fact, none of these countries are good analogies for what is happening in China. And probably the best analogy that we can have for China today is the rise of America in the 20th century. The extent of industrialization, urbanization, and mobilization of labor is nothing less than what has happened in the 20th century when America came up and the 19th century when Europe and England came up. And in a reality, the United States has shaped the rules of the game since World War II by installing institutions in place that have defined the way we operate and work with another economically and politically. The UN, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the development agencies have all come as a result of U.S. having control over the world institutions. I believe that China has essentially three possible scenarios. One, adapt fully to the existing institutions and play by the rules of the existing institutions. Two, make your own rules, develop new institutions and convince people, perhaps in, first in the developing world, that they should follow these new rules and join the Chinese institutions. And three, use a combination of both. Adapt to some of the existing institution and shape them to fit some of your needs. In the United States has done that for some time by, for example, stressing the importance of intellectual property rights in the WTO. How will China react and how will their needs be different? China will probably slow down significantly after it reached the $15,000 per capita GDP. That has happened in other East Asian countries and probably will happen in China. What that means, that if it reaches $15,000 per capita GDP, the Chinese economy will be about twice the size of the American economy. And at that point, the largest economy by far would also still be one that is developing. And its needs will be different than the needs of the United States and Western Europe. How will China change the rules of the game? How will Chinese OFDI be accepted by America and Europe? Those are all questions that only time will tell. Unlike some of Professor Sachs' questions, these questions will take a few years to resolve. <laughs> and until then, I hope that we have many more conferences in Colombia and Harvard and other great schools to try to resolve and discuss some of these questions. On this note, I'd like to invite uh, Peter Dresdell and uh, Shang Jin Wei to say concluding remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Elon, and thanks very much to the panel for what's been an incredibly interesting and productive conversation. Uh, just on your last comment there, it's true that uh, China has prospered within the framework of the great post-war institutions which were fashioned significantly at the initiative of this country. Uh, and its allies after the Second World War. One of the uh, important observations in this particular context, however, is that uh, uh, whilst we have relatively robust rules for uh, dealing with foreign trade, to which China has exceeded, uh, as it's ex exceeded de facto to many of the institutions and norms that govern the international economy, what we don't have 
is a system of global rules that governs foreign direct investment. Uh, and what we do is make up our own rules. Uh, if we're sensible, of course, we make up our own rules in our own best interest, which is to be welcoming mm. of foreign direct investment. And many successful economies mm. have open and welcoming rules towards foreign direct investment, and they've had open and welcoming rules towards Chinese foreign investment. We've been talking this afternoon about why that's a good thing. Uh, uh, we've been talking today uh, about what some of the problems and some of uh, the anxieties uh, are that are emerging on the horizon and whether or not they are real or imagined. Uh, I think that is the substance of an ongoing conversation that is terribly, terribly important uh, to the global system, uh, to this country, to my country, uh, to certainly the developing world. Uh, because in the case of uh, foreign direct investment in particular, you know, there is a particular uh, dimension of that which is intensely political. And that political thing is not only national political, it's international political and feeds back mm -hmm. into the, the milieu in which international relations are conducted uh, and will feed back inevitably into the milieu in which international relations are conducted between China and its partners in the global system. And as Yi Ping said, uh, you know, you know that China's grown spectacularly over the last uh, three decades in terms of GDP. It's grown even more spectacularly in terms of trade. Uh, and it's grown even more spectacularly still in terms of Chinese investment abroad in the last half decade or so and you ain't seen nothing yet uh, because uh, it's going to grow, as Yi Ping forecasts, uh, even more rapidly across a wider portfolio of interests sexually uh, and uh, economically down the track. So I want to thank uh, the panellists very much, my colleagues here at uh, Shazen. We're pleased to deal with Harvard, uh, you know, lower order institution, uh, uh, here at Columbia, together with uh, my own institution. Uh, and we look forward to, to this kind of conversation continuing around this subject and many other subjects uh, over the years ahead. Thank you very much.